Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of Prehistoric Planet Ice Age, our breakdown series we are covering new lands. This episode is the shortest of the lot as there was actually a surprising amount of variation in the run times of each of the episodes. This one is about 35 minutes I think, 35 or 37. It was a pretty short one, um, but maybe they just um, the showrunners couldn't really find too many more sequences to include for this um, this this sort of episode. But you never know. But this episode includes many species that are as a result of interchanges, whether it be in Eurasia or the Great American Interchange. We see many different species here. And without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? So we start with a very sleepy Arctotherium as he stretches and yawns in the morning rays. We get to be fully introduced to the size of this animal as he is truly a very impressive beast. So Arctotherium angustidens is the largest bear ever to evolve, which also makes it the largest carnivorous land mammal ever to evolve as well. So we see these wild dogs feeding on the carcass of a Macrochenia that either they killed or that another predator has killed. Looking at them more closely and in reference to uh, where they are located, they look to be a species of Protocyon, which was a genus of wild dog found across the Americas during the Pleistocene. Here you can see our Arctotherium is much larger than these dogs as he approaches the carcass. He stands off against them um, to take the carcass from them, using his great size to his advantage, as he is much larger than most other, than well, pretty much every other predator at the time, and so is able to basically just steal any kill he wants. Standing on his hind legs, he stands over four meters tall, tall enough to be able to look a Tyrannosaurus Rex in the eyes. He takes the carcass after, after batting away the smaller Protocyon, as he is here to stay, as the short-faced bears migrated down from North America and were able to colonize South America as well, becoming one of the top predators, if not the top predator, because I don't think Smilodon would even be able to compete against such a formidable predator. This episode focuses on how land bridges allowed animals to move throughout the world and get to places that were inaccessible due to the ocean. And there is particular focus on the Great American Interchange, which was caused when volcanoes along the edge of the Cocos and Caribbean tectonic plates spawned volcanoes that erupted to create new land between North and South America, creating what is now Central America, that allowed many animals from both continents to move between them. The Ice Age also um, drew up more fresh water, uh, more salt water as well, um, from the ocean. Um, and trapping it in glaciers and the ice sheet at the top of the world. And so sea levels also dropped, allowing more land to be available for animals to cross between islands. And so leads to certain scenarios that we see play out in this episode. We also get a shot of this herd of Colombian mammoths crossing a barren landscape. We meet a prehistoric squirrel in Central America that has taken inspiration from the modern variegated squirrel, a diversely coloured species found in the Americas today. We also see a modern spectacled bear, the only bear that is found in the tropical Americas today and the only remaining short-faced bear alive. As well as a yellow-throated toucan we also see on a branch. Growing in this tropical rainforest is cannonball fruit, a fruit that is quite a lot larger and rather solid that few animals are able to break into. But at this time, one likely could with ease, a Remotherium, the largest ground sloth ever discovered. The bigger the ground sloth species became, it is thought that they would be largely hairless, much like modern elephants, as living in a hot environment with a big shaggy coat would be rather uncomfortable and could also be dangerous as the animals could overheat. Using his great size, he is able to reach down and draw the cannonball fruit closer, and with his powerful jaws, cat cracks straight through it, exposing the fleshy blue fruit inside. Despite being largely hairless, he still has a um, a bit of hair in a few places, largely where heat loss is not that much of a worry such as the undersides of his forelimbs and along the top of his body. We then go to North America where a colonist from South America has moved in, the giant armadillos. This one in particular is Glyptotherium and the baby is quite eager to go look for water while his mum sleeps. The mother is awoken and they set off. I picked out this shot in particular as we 
We see the baby standing on its hind legs. Now this is something modern armadillos also do, to get a book, better look around and draw in more sense, as they don't have the best eyesight. They come to a water hole, but someone is already here, in the form of the towering Colombian mammoth, the second largest species of mammoth after the steppe mammoth from further north. So this is, in particular is a male, as you can see he has much larger tusks than the two females next to him. The design particularly, the trunk, takes a lot of inspiration from the modern savannah elephant and just shows an incredible level of detail with all the wrinkles and the small hairs that cover the body. The mammoths continue to drink after the bull scares the Galipto theorem away and this shot in particular really does remind me of a scene of savannah elephants drinking from a water hole. Masquerading as a crocodile, the baby Glypto Therium is seen swimming, which makes the mammoths quite nervous as their poor eyesight doesn't allow them to differentiate between a crocodile and a young Glypto Therium just enjoying a dip. But Glyptodonts are thought to have been fairly capable swimmers despite their rotund shells, as modern armadillos, anteaters and sloths are all quite capable swimmers. We then see a representation of large animals moving to offshore islands thanks to the lower sea levels provided by the ice, as we see these mammoths wandering along an exposed sandbar towards an island. Now this brings us to the island of Flores in Indonesia, of which this island you see here is not, but you get the idea. This island is in fact Ile Escudo, where the, the smallest modern sloth, the pygmy three-toed, resides. Here on Flores, we meet the dwarf Stegodon, a population of Stegodon that evolved into a new pygmy species, and, which, and so experienced some serious insular dwarfism, being many times smaller than any elephant alive today, being only three feet tall. The calf is even smaller and has a great level of detail with all the little hairs there that baby Asian elephants actually um, have on them as well. The calf plays with a beautiful blue butterfly. Now, I'm no entomologist, so I don't quite know what species of butterfly this is. All I know is it's blue and it's pretty. <laughs> However, the calf has strayed too far from safety and has come into the sight of Leptoptilos robustus, a giant six foot tall stork that was found in Flores during the Pleistocene and was one of the top predators alongside the Komodo dragon. This species is in the same genus as the modern marabou stork of Africa and the Agidans of Asia, of which the design shares some striking resemblance to. The Stegodon calf retreats into the tangled roots of a strangler fig tree where the stork is unable to reach. However, the commotion attracts the attention of more hungry storks and now the calf has three to deal with. But then the mother Stegodon bursts out from the forest to defend her calf and drive back the storks. Returning to South America, we see another animal that came from North America, the Smilodon, and its arrival in South America caused it to outcompete the native predators of the South American plains, the terror birds. This one in particular is one of the last, Solopterus, much smaller than the famous giant terror birds like Titanus and Kalenkin, but is a deadly predator in its own world, but is subordinate to the Smilodon, Canids and Arctotherium that have colonized its home. And so, a pair of Solopterus decide to follow the bigger predator and rely on the Smilodon to make a kill for them. Macrokenia returns as a prey item in this episode. The Smilodon attacks and brings down the animal quickly and efficiently, and this show in particular is really cool, like it, it is, it, it's just iconic at this rate, <laughs> and does look like a real big cat on a kill when it's being filmed and looking straight at at the cameraman like it's it's very intimidating like if i saw that looking at me i would not i i i, I would just walk away i would walk away very swiftly <laughs> the solopterous brothers flank the smiled on and his kill to create a sort of tag team dynamic where one distracts the cat and the other runs in to steal some meat as the Smilodon feeds, we see it chewing at to the side of its jaws, using not its sabers, but its cutting cheek teeth, known as carnassials, that are perfect for slicing through meat. The sabers are a killing tool rather than kitchen utensils. When one Solopterus approaches, we get this great shot of the Smilodon, with a bloody muzzle and teeth, roaring at the bird. 
But after some cunning thievery, the Solopterus get some chunks of meat for themselves as the Smilodon continues to feed on his prize. Very quick one, New Lands was a very short episode and yeah, we got a lot in, in, in that time. Like we got Arctotherium, we got the Stegodon and the Leptoptilus, we got the, the Solopterus, the Columbian Mammoths, the Glyptotherium, the Arimatherium, loads of great animals that really do show this idea pretty well that animals were out competing others and just going into unfamiliar landscapes and their modern relatives survive there to this day like when glypto even though glyptotherium is is gone the nine banded armadillo still lives in north america and even though the terror birds are gone south america still has the seriemas which are their closest living relatives but let me know what you thought of new lands what your favorite creature or sequence was in this episode leave those down in the comments and i will see you for Desert Lands.